Welcome to our Phoebe evening session that we have uh, once a month. Okay, thank you. Please um, help yourself to some pizza. And um, we have a fun topic tonight, and I'm not going to spill the beans. I'm actually going to turn it over to Diane, and she's going to be our moderator, and she's also um, going to introduce our panel. So thanks, Diane. Those of you who don't know me, my name is Diane Helbig. I have a consulting firm called Seize This Day. I work mainly with small business owners, helping them problem solve. Um, I have an internet radio show and um, am an author of a couple of books. And um, I love doing this. This is fun for me because it's relatively easy for me. These guys are on the hot seat. Um, and so we have a couple of um, agribusinesses who are going to share some information with you guys. I do want to let you know that we were supposed to have, is it Davin? Dovin? Um, here, but they had uh, uh, an emergency situation on the farm so they could not be here. Because they had to get it taken care of because apparently a storm's coming. So, you know, it's the life of owning a farm. This is the way things happen. So we're sorry to not have them. But we're going to do without them. So I am actually going to ask each of you to do an uh, introduction of yourself and your organization. And um, if you would, um, how you got started. Um, OK, my name is uh, Jim Dostal. Um, my wife over, is over here. She's Judy Dostal. Um, we, uh, we've been farming since 1995. Um, we own Dostal Farms, which we sell beef, pork, poultry, brown eggs, honey, maple syrup, and lamb. Um, we have some brochures and stuff sitting around if you want to look at them there. Um, we got started farming basically because we were concerned about what our two young daughters were going to be eating. Um, at the time, there was a lot of stuff, even back then, um, people asking about, you know, hormones and steroids and all kinds of different stuff. So we just thought, well, you know what? we Let's try it, you know. So um, I come from a, a family with a lot of farms. Um, my mom's from Pennsylvania, and back in Pennsylvania, her family had big farms, you know, 1,400 acres, soybeans, corn, all kinds of stuff. So um, I was always fascinated with it. And then, um, you know, like I said, we just decided we were going to start our small farm, and it started as just enough to feed our family and friends. And the next thing you know, it just kind of grew, and then it grew, and then we started doing some marketing, and then word of mouth, and next thing you know, here we are, you know, now, and we've sold, I think we've sold 10 cows in the month of June. Um, and that's all directly to families and customers. So we started out in 95, and it's just been just a nice steady growth ever since. So that's our history. That's great. Thank you. Ellen. Hello, I'm Ellen Andrews, and uh, with Joanne, we own uh, Abundant Blessing Alpaca Farm. Uh, we started in 2000 and late 2004, and uh, actually bought the farm <laughs> in early 2005. Uh, my background is uh, management. I worked in the business industry. I actually started out as an educator, taught high school, uh, moved to the business sector, uh, did that for about 25 years and then uh, became a franchisee for Sylvan Learning Centers. We did that for about five years and then the corporation wanted to buy back the centers in the Cleveland area, so we sold back our center and decided that we wanted to become farmers and that's how we uh, started with alpacas. So um, we've been doing it now for 11 going on 12 years. We started with seven alpaca, we now have 30 and four llamas and a miniature donkey. Uh, and the way we focus on the business is through uh, the fiber. And so we brought some of our products uh, for some of the different things that the fiber can be used for. Okay, nothing new on this story since she just kind of laid it out. I'm Joanne Bisgrove. Um, my husband and I um, joined partners with her. We've known her forever, so we've been friends. We worked at McDonald's together. I was with, I've was with. i been in the fast food industry most of my careers um, with McDonald's and now Subway, and I was with her at uh, Sylvan. Um, so then we did decide to kind of step back from corporate America, and we got the farm, and we got going in it, and um, we really love it. I mean, it, it's been a great experience. I mean, we've had a lot of challenges, and I know we'll talk about that a little bit, but um, I wouldn't do anything different. I mean, 
we're now back working in the corporate America again, but it's okay. It's okay. Thank you. You hang on to that. So thank you. I, this is so interesting for me. As, as they were talking about this, I was thinking um, that I was interviewed for a magazine, uh, the Cozy magazine, a couple of um, years ago, and the woman said to me when she was done interviewing me about, I don't know, whatever we were talking about, she said, if you weren't doing this, what would you be doing? And I said, I'd be a farmer. And she laughed and thought, you'd be a farmer. She said, no one ever says that. And I'm like, I know, but I just think I would be a farmer. Like, not with animals, with vegetables. And, you know, it's sort of Mother Earth and getting back into, you know, connecting to the world that we live in. And so I, that thought just like came into my head. I thought, see, I sort of get it. I don't know that I could do it, but I sort of get it. So, Jim, you said the reason that you started was because you were concerned about the food that your kids were consuming. So that's what inspired you to do it along with having really a family history of um, farming. I'm wondering, is, is that why you picked the, the animals and the sorts of um, produce, products that you are really providing on your farm? When we started this, uh, you know, I was working full time at the time and my wife was working full time and we had two young kids, a mortgage and stuff. And financially, it was just not feasible for us to go buy combines and tractors and, you know, all the, the financial end of it, what it takes to, to get started in big time farming. Um, understanding that a lot of your guys and a lot of my friends that are farming now multiple acres, it's been in the family for generations. So it's been passed down, you know, so the tractors are paid for, or the, you know, the land is paid for. Um, but we wanted to focus more on the, the consumer side of it. Um, we didn't really want to grow a crop. Uh, if you come to our farm, the whole thing is on four acres. So we don't have like, you know, acres and acres of corn and soybean and all that kind of stuff. Uh, we do rent some land um, that we, we usually grow hay on it and that's it. And we just bale that up and that's what we feed some of the cows and stuff through the winter. Um, but we wanted to get into something where we could get in and not have a, a huge financial um, commitment um, so that we could just get going and, and then start selling product right away and hopefully start making a lot of our money back that way. So, um, you know, we probably started with, I think our first group of cows, we bought two, you know. And the next thing you know, now we, now we go and we buy, you know, eight, nine, ten at a time. So um, we don't have, like... Um, a lot of brood cows, like some guys will have brood cows where they have to, um, you know, keep them on pasture and they breed them and then they have, you know, um, babies, you know, once a year. Uh, we don't do that. We've found some really good guys that have really good product and really good calves at usually a really reasonable price. Uh, and then we usually buy those. Okay. So, and we do the same thing with pork. We, we found a farmer that has really good stock and we buy the baby, you know, 40 pound pigs and we feed them out. And, and sell them that way. So, um, yeah, for us, it was just, it was a financial thing. We really didn't want to get into going and, and locking ourselves in for years and having to pay a huge amount of, you know, debt. So. But you, but were you expecting to, because you said we started it really with just, you know, feeding our family and our friends, and then through word of mouth and people finding out about it, it has grown since then. Were you really planning on growing it into where it is now and growing it beyond now? Or was it a, you know, th this is, for lack of a better word, sort of an experiment of, you know, we just want to be able to provide for ourselves? No, I, I think we always, there was always something there with us. Me and my wife, I think, both felt the same way. There was always something where we always looked down the road as we really like to get out of our jobs and just do this full time. Um, and that's where we're at today. It's still our, it's still pretty much our goal. Okay. Um, I work off the farm a little bit as a subcontractor, um, but for the most part, I'm on the farm all every day. Um, and my wife still has her job. So, but yeah, eventually here, once the kids are out of college and stuff, we're kind of hoping we can do this full time okay. and be financially, you know, secure. That's great. So. Thank you, Ellen. So, so. My, my question is really, so what inspired you? And the reason I'm asking it is because to go from educator to corporate to franchise to alpaca <laughs> you know, seems to be a bit of an interesting road. So how do you get there? How is it that that's the decision? 
Well, part of it uh, that I didn't say in my history is that I've always loved animals. I also rescued dogs and cats, and my focus with them is on seniors and handicapped animals. So I've always had a weak spot. People ask me to foster dogs and cats, and I say, I can't do it because after 10 seconds, I'm in love. <laughs> so um, I've always loved animals, and when um, when we were talking about leaving corporate America, both, I mean, I found that even as a franchisee, you're still dealing with corporate America because you have rules, regulations, and things to follow, which you may not always agree with, but yeah. you're bound to represent the company. And I was ready to be done with that because, <laughs> just because. <laughs> so uh, when we talked about what we were going to do next, and it was kind of a, a family decision, even though we're not family, we're kind of family. Um, Animal lover, animal lover. And I just happened to say one day, well, what about alpacas? Because I had read and studied some about them. Her response was, what's an alpaca? <laughs> <laughs> so we started to do our homework and look into it. But it didn't take us long. It was probably within a three-month period of time where we went from selling the, um, the Sylvans. And they sold their house. We looked for a farm. We bought a few animals. We boarded them with the uh, people we bought them from for a while until we had a place to bring them. And then January 2005, we moved them to the farm and started learning even more about alpacas. So we went to different seminars and uh, alpaca shows to uh, learn the business and that. And really, for the first year, we did it full time because we were learning every day. And we still learn every day. Sometimes we say, it's only taken us 10 years to figure <laughs> out that this is the better way to do it. But uh, it's our love of animals, our love of um, being able to be outside with nature and everything else. And I mean, farming is 365, yeah. you know, morning, noon, and night many times. So, um, but we just love it. And um, that's why we went into it is because we wanted to do something that we loved. Joanne, you want to add anything to that? really has has it all in a nutshell I mean we we have been very lucky um, what she's right we wanted to step back but the animal loving part has been um, what drove us and I mean to this day we still walk out there at night and you know we, we do the feedings in the morning early it just there's such a piece to it mm. that just makes you just go okay this is okay you can go deal with work and then you come home <laughs> and it's um, it's really enjoyable I mean we really have been very lucky and we have a lot of fun and we're lucky too because my mother and sister and brother everyone lives we live all down one street so we're all about 45 seconds away <laughs> from each other so if you need something we got it like when we're sharing and everything else everyone pitches in it's a big team effort so we've been really lucky with that it's really great and and I um, so so the topic you know agricultural entrepreneurism you could actually stop and think well if I don't want to farm why would that topic be of interest to me, right? And what's interesting for me is the answer is because it's, it's one industry of entrepreneurism, right? And, and I hear things that you guys are saying like, you know, you, you can totally shift from where you are to someplace else. I did it in my business. And at any age, and at any time, and, and you can make any decision you want, any time in your life and say, you know what? Now I feel like trying this. Now I feel like doing this as long as you're willing to learn, right? Because you didn't know anything about it. And so as long as you say, this is something that I might not have known before, but I'm really interested in it, and I would like to learn it, it really is, it's continuous learning, and being open to going ahead and just trying something, right? So those are, real, for me, those are like some of the lessons that we learn about being entrepreneurs, that there's always something new happening, there's always something we can learn and take from maybe someone else's experience. There's plenty of people out there who are willing to share their experience with us. And then making decisions, Jim, like you did, saying, okay, this is what we want to do, but we have to really think about how can we really do it. Like, what makes sense to do it, you know? Do we go ahead and try and you know, buy a big farm and start from scratch doesn't necessarily make sense. So we scale. And we say, if we start here, we can build it up from here. And these are just the kinds of decisions that, that are entrepreneurial. They're the kinds of decisions that entrepreneurs make all the time. So I, that's what I appreciate from listening to the stories because, I mean, I'm fascinated that it's alpacas, but 
you know, it's, it's more than that. It's making a decision to do something totally different and then leaning into it and learning everything that you can. So I appreciate you guys sharing that, that lesson, those lessons with us. My next question is, and we'll start over here with you, Joanne. Did you seek help or guidance from anyone? And if so, like any organization or any person, and if so, who, what, and can you share with us what that was about? Pack industry, what we found is everyone just loves working together. So we met people and we, like she said, we went to shows, we went to different seminars and that, but everyone just, it's a team. I mean, we have people that live around us and an animal sick, somebody needs something, we're there. I mean, we don't, we have so many good friends that we've gotten out of this that it's been fantastic. I mean, they're our closest friends now. And I mean, that the, the one does our shearing, the other one, you know, she, we just pitch in and help each other constantly. So we did seek out um, different seminars that we would go to and that, but really working with the people right in our area. And Vermilion, well, Ohio is one of the most concentrated alpaca farm states so, when we started. So there was a, a great amount of resources, and which is kind of crazy for our weather with our hot summers and everything else, <laughs> but it, it is. It would just got to be that it was, it's very saturated. And so we had a lot of different people we, we could learn from. And when we got our llamas, we learned from those people. So we had another contact. And then, you know, I mean, just the veterinary um, system at Wellington is who we use. They're a great resource for us. So um, there's a lot of big learning curves, but that we've had, we had so much support. That's, if nothing else we learned from this, that the alpaca people love being alpaca people and working together. So. I can add to it. I mean, we joined uh, the National Alpaca Association for Owners. We also joined the Ohio uh, branch of that. Uh, alpacas are registered, so we had to work through the registry to, um, you know, get our animals certified in that uh, after they were born, and they track their uh, pedigree uh, overall, which is typical in most industries in that. So um, I would say all of that was helpful to us because they were all resources. But I agree with Joanne, our biggest resource has been the farmers. I mean, we were surprised when we got in Vermilion that th there were like six farms within five minutes of us that had alpacas in that. And uh, they all will drop anything to come and help uh, when there are issues in that. So. Uh, again, we've been very fortunate. Jim. I'm going to stand up. <laughs> um, for, for me, that's, that's an easy question to answer. Um, when I was younger and graduated high school, I had a little bit of college here at, uh, here at LC, um, but I didn't have a whole lot of college. Um, at that time, I started working in a factory, worked in a factory for 24 years. So when I um, left the factory life and decided to, to be an entrepreneur, um, I quickly realized that um, there's a lot to be an entrepreneur. I mean, it, it's easy to go in the barn and feed some cows and pigs, but when you have to start looking at balance sheets and, you know, P&L sheets and you're, and you're trying to figure out what to do with your marketing and, you know, record keeping and all this stuff, taxes and everything else, um, it was a bit overwhelming for me. Um, my wife is really smart. She works in a business office, so she knows a lot, but it's different when you have your own business as opposed to doing what somebody else tells you to do. Um, for me, I joined a BNI. Um, so joined a BNI, um, quickly made some friends in there, um, got a business coach. He helped me set my pricing, took us to a different level, um, hooked up with a uh, internet marketing guy. He came in, set up our website, made a lot of changes for us, and then I also hooked up with our accountant um, in the same BNI group. And you know, working with these guys, it, it for me, um, like I said, having limited college and not knowing how to run a business, I mean, the BNI group was huge. Um, I got in there. One of the things you do in BNI is you are required to have um, like monthly one-to-one -one meetings. So you can sit down with another guy, you know, that's another business owner, and you can talk, you know. And a lot of times for me, there was there was cases where I would go, man, I'm looking at this, and I'm like, man, I don't I don't know what to do. And my buddy that owns a business is sitting there across from me, and we're having coffee, and he says, that's easy. I've been through that five times. Here's what you're going to do. And so um, having that knowledge, that support group, that friendship with with the BNI team, 
uh, was, was huge for us and our business. So. For small business owners, and it's finding the community that, you, that fits you, right? And finding the people who are supportive of you and who have had experiences that you can borrow from and you've had experiences they can borrow from. And so it, it's, it's, a, um, it's a safer place to be and it's a less scary place to be, right? When you know there are people who you can reach out to who have your back. Right? and who are solely interested in helping you be successful. They don't want anything else from you for that. That's really what they want. And they're out there. They're everywhere, you know. So it's really great. I appreciate that. And it's a little different. You know, it's the same concept, but in, in different ways. So thank you. So um, believe it or not, you guys will believe it. See if you guys believe it. Sometimes there are challenges in businesses, right? So one of the things that I was wondering if you would share is a challenge that you have had in your business and how you overcame it. There was a lot of challenges. Um, one of the things that we kind of struggled with at first was um, buying enough animals to make sure that we could sell them. Oh. Uh, you know, when you, when, you're, when you have to go buy a bunch of calves, um, you know, you buy them and then, and then you, you're, you look at all these animals in the barn and you're kind of standing there going, Oh my gosh! Did we like overdo it here? I mean, how are we going to sell all these things? So, for us, it was just kind of um, trying to figure out how to, to to budget it. You know, I mean, how to how to plan it, because sometimes you can buy, you know, you buy ten calves and they're all different sizes, anywhere from you know 800 pounds down to 400 pounds. Um, so obviously, some of the 800 pounders are going to be ready to go quicker. So then you're kind of thinking, okay, if you know, I got to make sure I got buyers for those, um, and that's kind of where our internet marketing and some of that came in. Um, it kind of helped us uh, build our customer base. Um, but my wife does a really good job with mass texting. <laughs> I mean, she'll she'll sit down on a Friday night and go, okay, I'm sending out a mass text, and by the end of the night, we got a whole cow sold. Because, you know, everybody should just say, I got a quarter beef available, and next thing you know, we got a cow sold. It took us, I, I told you we started with seven um, alpaca. Uh, one of the first things we had to learn was the whole breeding process in terms of selecting um, the right animals to breed in order to improve the herd. Because that was one of our major focuses was improving the quality of our animals so that we had quality fiber to work with and everything else. And al alpaca just have, um, well, they have a 12-month gestation period, and then they only have one baby at a time. <laughs> so it, it's a long process, and um, there's a lot of ups and downs. I think some of the earliest challenges for us were learning how to care for the creas who are born with really no uh, immune system, and um, learning to be so keyed into their behavior that you know when something's wrong. Because alpacas have really no defense system, they hide everything. And so there's a constant awareness of what do they need or why are they acting differently. And most of the time, by the time you notice it, and we've gotten better, but by the time you notice it, it's usually too late. And I, that's an extremely frustrating thing for, uh, for us to handle. And uh, so we had a lot of ups and downs with the, the breeding program in terms of dealing with the loss and then uh, also, you know, being almost overly cautious and watching the babies when they were born, uh, trying to make sure. And, and Joanne had a very hard time <laughs> with that. Um, I mean, she lives right on the farm, so mm -hmm. I always thought that I was going to get there in the morning and find her sleeping out there <laughs> with them. Um, so that was a challenge. And um, by the time we really improved our herd and felt like we were getting a better quality and I'll, I'll stop here, that's when the economy tanked. Oof. And so when we were finally ready to start selling some of our better quality animals, the alpaca market dived with the housing market. And so we had to make some decisions since we never wanted to be a super big farm. If any of you have driven up Route 83 and seen uh, the farm there where they have 1,500 alpaca, we never wanted to do that because we realized that if we're going to be tuned in to what they need and know when there is a problem, we wanted to stay small. And our goal was 30, and that's where we are. So 
one of our decisions was to actually stop breeding for a while, so we did not get bigger. And so now. One of the other challenges we had was um, what was real big when we first started was taking your alpacas to the shows. And we thought this was great, and you spend all this money, and you take them to the shows, and they get ribbons, and then nothing really happens. So we're like, this is kind of stupid. <laughs> so we, were, we learned that, I mean, it was fun. We learned a lot, but it, we, we weren't getting anywhere with it. So we said, you know, let's take a look at how important this is. And what really actually happened was there was a show where there was um, some kind of contagious respiratory infection that the animals could get. Well, as soon as we heard about that, we said, that's it. We just, we canceled. We weren't going. Some of the other ones still thought they would try it, but we said, no, we, we were not, not risking our animals for show because we really got into it for the fiber industry. And we just kept hoping that it would change. And what we found, another challenge we had with the farm, uh, some of the other farms is that they were all very big on, okay, I'm sending my fleece in to be processed, I'm getting my fleece back. Well, then, okay, you get one pair of socks. And we're going, no, you need to send into the fiber co-ops so we can get, build up the American, you know, uh, pool of this stuff. So we've learned that part of it, um, you know, stepping back, and we haven't gone to shows for several years, especially once that um, outbreak happened, we were not going to risk our animals. And, and our vet, we took some good words of advice from him. He said, you know, um, we talk about, I mean, we're very careful about what shoes go into the farm, you know, just people don't just walk in because they could have anything on their feet. And, you know, and, the, and that's what the vet said. He goes, they're not made to go into gymnasiums and halls and stuff like that. He goes, you know, keep, take care of them first. And, that, and we heeded that, and uh, we've been real successful with that since then. So I think that was a hard lesson. But, I mean, we had fun at the shows, but now we're really focusing on that, and we're hoping to keep turning the rest of the groups that way so we can grow it. That, that's so interesting. So, Jim, it's uh, inventory management and being able to sell, you know, always having to pay attention to uh, that balance between having enough inventory and selling it and b being able to sell enough that in the right time that you can then have money to reinvest in your business. Um, the, the value of staying small. Not everybody has to be big and not every small business wants to be a big business. It's really okay to say, I really like being a small business. It's what works for me. It's what makes me happy. It's where I am best suited. And that's great because we need more small businesses. So, and you can be more nimble and more flexible when you're small than you can when you're large. And um, the, the trade, you know, going to these shows, going to these animal shows, in all of our businesses, we are always going to try things. We're going to try networking. We're going to try, you know, joining an organization. We're going to try just sending ours out and getting ours back or maybe sending it to the co-op. We're going to try doing these shows. And the key is to pay attention to what's working. Because some things will work for a while, and then they will stop. Some things will never work, and you will feel like, wait a minute, everyone else is doing this. Seems to be working for them. I'm not liking this, right? And you have to go with, I'm not liking this. It's not working for me, and that's OK. I'm going to stop doing it. And that sort of that goes on constantly in, in small business. There's always these things that happen that you always have to be evaluating. Is it serving me? You know, is it serving my business? And if it's serving it, great. And when it's not, you gotta jettison. You know, you just you 86 it. You move on and find something else and just keep trying. That's how we fine tune and really develop those systems and processes that really work really well. So before I turn it over to the group and let them ask you some questions, my last question is: What one piece of advice would you give? to a startup or an aspiring entrepreneur? If there's anyone thinking, boy, I'd like to launch, I'd like to try something, or I am really, you know, I'm a baby, right? I am brand new in this. Is there one thing that you would share with them? Because then I was like, I'm ready for change, and I jumped right in, both feet, and it was good. But really, I mean, and we did a lot of homework, but I wish we'd have done a little more homework first. I think it just helped us along the way um, to not make, we didn't make a lot, it, not that it was a lot of mistakes, but we made jobs harder than they needed to be. And so I think just doing a little more research and, you know, just dig into what you're looking for and see, you know, you want to see all sides of it because there's a lot of sides that are rough. I mean, like in the winter and stuff, it's a lot different than farming in the summer. And just to know all the answers and the different aspects of it, just do the homework on it. But I think if you want to do it and it's in your heart, I say go for it. <laughs> That's great. Ellen? Yeah, I, I still go back to, um, do what you love. I think any of us that, I mean, there isn't a job out there that doesn't have unpleasant things about it. And um, to get through those times, I think you really have to um, be focused on doing something that's important to you and that you enjoy. 
Um, we spend too much time working to not enjoy it. So um, that to me is an extremely important thing. I agree with Joanne in terms of making sure you have your plan and you do enough homework up front. But I also think that um, when you feel it's time to make a change, have the courage that you will have the strength to make the change and do things right. Uh, there's, there's nothing easy about uh, going to work every day for a job you don't like, okay? There's nothing easy about uh, owning your own business and starting up. But there's so many possibilities uh, in that that I, I think if you pick something you know you're, you enjoy, um, you'll find the way to make it better and improve it. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, anybody here gets a uh, success magazine? Do you listen to the audio, the video? Gary Vanderchuk? Awesome. <laughs> what did he say in that, video, in that little audio? He said four words that totally blew me away. Mobile, defer, mobile device first economy. Oh. I was like, wow. Mobile device first economy. He said, radio is gone. Newspapers, phone books, gone. He said, if you own a business, you need to tailor your business. You need to figure out how to be mobile device first because everybody looks on their phones for everything now. Sure. And I heard that the other day when I listened to it, and I was just like, wow, that is, that's huge. I mean, if you can get your marketing to, you know, to get into that concept, and if you can get, your, get yourself where you're, when people look at your stuff on the phone, um, I think that could really take your business to the next level. Um, if you pull out your phone right now and you type in Firewood Lorain County, I'm the first one that pops up. So, <laughs> so if you're looking for Firewood, it's, it's, I'm gonna come up first. <laughs> but it's all, my, my web guy has tailored a lot of our web stuff for the cell phone. Um, you, have to have a, you have to have a website that is mobile friendly. It's true. You, there's nothing worse than trying to look up something on your cell phone and it's not mobile friendly and you got to go through and you got to open it up and do all this and you can't read it. It's not only that, but Google has changed its algorithm so that if you, are, if you do not have a mobile friendly uh, yes. website, they will punish you. Yes, so they it's, will. it's even worse than making yep. people crazy trying to find your information and not being able to. You will go down in the rankings instead of up. There's a great article on Fast Company this month about mobile. Yes. So it's the future. So, so I mean, for us, I'm. I'm taking my web guy to dinner tomorrow night, and we're going to talk about some things and try to get do other things. He's got some ideas. I want to figure out how I can get myself even higher up there in the Google list, and and because I think I really think that's that mobile device first. I think that's what everybody. I mean, look, she's on her phone. He's on his <laughs> phone. <Look at. laughs> What's that? Were you looking at fire? So, <laughs> that's great. I, I mean, for me, I just I think that's where I see us going. I mean, I really want to get that even better. I want more people to find us on on their phones because I think I think the guy's right. I think that's where everybody is. Our, yeah. our society is it's so focused true. around that. It's you know, so true. entrepreneurs have a bad habit of doing bright shiny object, right? We all do it with. Oh, look, that looks. Oh, wait, I think I want to do that. Oh, no, that's even greater. Okay. That's really great, because we should be really energetic, but do your homework, pull the trigger, right? Don't do so much homework that you are paralyzed and never make a decision, and embrace technology and embrace what's new. You cannot stay in the same old place and be successful today. You have to evolve, your business has to evolve, right? And you have to be willing to look at what's out there and say, how can I use this to my advantage in my business, right? So thank you. That, those, that was wonderful. So now I'm going to open it up to you guys. So I just had a comment to what you were saying about the phones. You know how when we talk in marketing and we always use the example of it's not a facial tissue, it's a Kleenex. It's not a cotton swab, but it's a Q-tip. Well, how many of you say, well, just Google it instead of go research it? Just Google it. And so Google has done that to us. <laughs> but you're, I mean, you're, I, I believe you're right on point. I mean, look how many of us have our phones sitting here. And so that was an excellent point. Right. Well, the, the magazine is Success Magazine. And every, every month they give you an, an audio, D 
DVD to listen to. And like I said, the guy's name is Gary Vander Vaynerchuk or something like that. But yeah, he's great. Yeah. Yeah. I, for me personally too, I like Mel Robbins. She's awesome. I love listening to her speak. I watch her TED talks all the time. I got her on my phone. Um, I just love that kind of stuff. I love that kind of motivational stuff, you know, kind of get you thinking outside the box and kind of get you fired up a little bit. So, yeah. Jim, yeah. Before, before you sit down, what? Uh, <laughs> it's interesting because the editor of that magazine of success is Darren Hardy. And do you get his daily message? I do not get his, no. Okay, his daily message for today was want to learn how to be the cash cow, so to speak, in your business? Uh, <clears throat> ask yourself, what is your milk-making contribution to the success of your dairy farm? Where do you need to hire other people to complete the process so you can stick to making milk? Rather apropos. Rather apropos to yeah. our, our ag entrepreneurial discussion. Huh? Okay, I'm just real interested in the alpacas. What was like the first thing or the big surprise or that alpacas were to you after you started handling them? Alpacas are extremely cautious animals. I mean, they look cute and fluffy and everything else. But um, what we found was that they have a basic fear of being around people. Um, and the, the alpacas that we had did not like to be handled at all. So um, it took us a long time with some of the older alpacas that we started with to get them to be comfortable around us. I mean, we're out there every day. We talk to them every day. I, I mean, they, we were told they will never learn their names. They're, you know, they're not smart animals. You can't really teach them anything. We found all that was not true. Um, uh, we work very carefully to adjust our behavior to what they need. They don't like quick actions. They don't like loud noises. And so we try to blend our behavior to do that. And, um, and it's worked for us. Our, our animals are uh, extremely comfortable around us um, in terms of administering their shots for worming and everything else. Uh, where we started with that in terms of trying to catch them and, and actually give them the shots and that, that was quite a challenge. Uh, we amaze ourselves now how easy it is for us to handle them and do that. And I said that's one of the other things that we're very good at is we, we know what each one of us is good at doing. And that's the great thing about a team is that Joanne hates to give shots, I give shots, she gets to handle and um, you know, hold them while we do it in that. But um, that's what we learned the most was that, and that's where our behavior has changed, is we will not do things to make them uncomfortable. Like when we were asked, would we bring an alpaca here? We said, no, we wouldn't do that because they become so stressed. Uh, and that's one of the things stress, just as for humans, it's not healthy for them to be stressed. So we try to adjust what we do to meet their needs. I had a question related, like related to relationships with other companies. So for example, you will have to have somebody process your meat and then I don't know if you guys actually make the products yourself, but having, um, or, if, or if you have somebody else do that, because it sounds like you have a co-op that you're involved with. Um, have you been able to leverage those relationships to build your business as well? I'm thinking, you know, for us, we actually have a vegetable farm, and, and it's a roadside stand, and we do have relationships with other um, businesses like convenience and things like that, but is, have you found a good way to leverage those relationships to build your, basically, your base of your, of your company? Um, for us, the, like, like you mentioned, um, processing the meat and stuff like that, yeah, we, we deal with one processor, um, Rosperts, out of uh, Norwalk. We, do, we only deal with one. Um, we actually negotiated a little better price with them. Um, so it, was, it just makes things really easy. We're really happy with working with them, and they, we're actually their second biggest customer that actually you know, brings animals through there. Um, so yeah, that relationship was, was big for us. Um, it was nice to know what we'd have to pay you know, not ha not get any surprises. You know what I mean? Well, we upped our rate by you know whatever. So um, that and like uh, like for the animals, like I said, we have uh, there's a pig farm um, that we deal with. One guy, 
Um, we know our animals are going to be healthy when we get them. We know they're not going to be sick. We know they're going to grow pretty well. The finished product is, is really good. Um, and the same way with our cows. We buy from two or three guys exclusively. We don't go to auctions. You go to auctions, a lot of times they run them through, like you said, they go through a ring. I mean, there's been how many hundreds of animals in there before them. So by the time you get them home, God only knows what they got. So you're better off just going to one farm and buying. You may have to pay a little more sometimes, um, but it's, it's, it's better when you know when you, when you trailer that animal home and it's stressed and it's 90 degrees that, that it's going to be okay. You know, it's not, you're not going to have to call the vet out four and five times, you know, to try to get it back to health or, or even lose it. I mean, I've had friends of mine, they get them, they haul them home in a trailer and they open a trailer and they're dead. So, because cattle can be temperamental. They can be very, you know, I'm, any farm animal really. I mean, they, they don't, they don't cool well, you know, they don't travel well. It, it's, it's just unnatural for them. So. But yeah, for us, that's what, that's what we do. And do you want to add to that? or? I mean, we've built a relationship with our fi fiber co-ops. We belong to two, well, kind of three, uh, the one we don't really use that much. But uh, the first one we joined um, was using a special processing where you had to, after shearing the fleece, it had to be sorted by one of their certified sorters. And the idea was to get a consistency in the product so that when the product was milled, um, it would not be itchy or scratchy against your skin. Uh, and that was fine, but what we found was when we paid the extra money to have it sorted and then shipped to the co-op, the, I believe the first time we got product back, I want to say it was about 18 months. So what we said was, how is this ever going to work where we're going to have product to sell when it's taking this long to go through the process? So we started to look into other co-ops, and that's when um, we started to work with the New England Fiber Co-op, which is, it comes from a milling area where they took existing mills that were out of business and converted it to uh, process the alpaca fiber. Alpaca fiber cannot be processed in a mill that's set up for other types of fiber. So unless there's a large amount of product to run through a mill, they had no reason to set it up. So you had a lot of mini mills that individual farms were setting up. But again, the process would take a long time because they were running their farms, trying to mill and do everything else. So we found that working uh, New England has probably been our best return in terms of we send them fiber. Um, they have a list of products available. We have to submit so much fiber of a particular kind from the different parts of the body of the animal to order different products in that. But it has worked very well for us in terms of being able to get things back. Uh, we still belong to the other co-op, but it, I mean, it, they still have, last time we sent them fiber was probably over five years ago, and they still have our fiber. And um, so seeing the return on that hasn't been real great. <laughs> There's New England. We get it within, you know, a couple weeks. So, did you want to? Um, what kind of, like, government registration and, like, uh, inspections do you go through to start this? As far as government, uh, we, um, yeah, none, none, none really. I mean, once you get to be uh, really big and you start to have um, a tremendous amount of animals, which we're not there yet, um, the the uh, EPA will come in, and you do have to have a manure management plan, um, and you'll have to you'll have to basically be able to write down, you know, um, we're going to have so many thousands of tons of manure a year, and this is what we're going to do with it. Um, it but you got to you got to be really big um, to do that kind of stuff. The only other thing for us is the when we process the meat. Um, one of the one of the things about buying local beef and local pork is when the animals are processed, every single animal is inspected. When they kill the animals, there's an, a state inspector on the floor every day, and he pulls two tubes of, of flesh from, eat from that animal. There's like 10 or 11 things that he checks for, salmonella, E. coli. Um, help me out, babe, what are they? I can't remember all the rest of them. But there's like 
like 11 tests that they'll go through. So I know that my meat is, is good. Now, if it comes back and there's a problem, I can't sell it. So, and that's, when you go to these really big slaughterhouses, only one in 24 animals gets inspected. So when you buy local and you buy from a local people, like at Rosper, it's on the kill floor. Like I said, there's a, there's a state inspector there every day. They only kill two days a week. So, and that's FDA regulated. So. There are no other questions. I'm going to ask you all to give these guys a big round of applause.